Bueno, eh, eguardion berriro, iruditzen balin bat zaizue hasi ingo gara, eh, bigarren txandarekin. Eh, lehenik eta behin, barkamenak eskatu nahi ditut, zeren lehen ez dakit zergaitik, eh, ba, esan dut, eh, atxeren aldiaren ondoren, miren larrea irakaslearen itzaldi izango gendula, eta hor bukatuko genuela. Eta tartean, ba, jandut e, gaurko beste e, gure izarretako bat eta barkamenak eskatu nahi dizkiot. E, bueno, hori izu harria da, e, aurkezpen hau egitean eretzat, gainera e, bere ibilbide profesionala, Rod Phillipsen ibilbide profesionala izu harria da, e, izu horrezko esperientzia dauka, izu horrezko jakituria dauka, e, bere edukiak, bere lan edukiak oso oso interesgarriak eh, dira. Entonces, bueno, como decía, es verdaderamente un placer presentar a Rod, eh, Rod Phillips. Eh, voy a leer muy brevemente una pequeña presentación. No, no me quiero demorar excesivamente, pero sí me gustaría dar la relevancia que le merece. Rod Phillips es presidente de Greater Toronto Civic Action Alliance, organización que promueve la gobernanza colaborativa en el área metropolitana de Toronto. A través del trabajo conjunto de los líderes empresariales, políticos y sociales, Toronto ha sabido responder con éxito a sus principales retos estratégicos en el ámbito económico, social, cultural y ambiental. Eh, también es presidente de Postmedia Network, el grupo de comunicación que es líder en la prensa e internet en Canadá. Esta mañana hemos estado hablando eh, bueno, de la tecnología digital yo creo que nos va a interesar mucho esta intervención. Es también director global de Affinity, corporación tecnológica dedicada a las soluciones empresariales de inteligencia artificial. Previamente fue presidente y consejero delegado en Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation y director también de gabinete del alcalde de Toronto, Mel Lastman. Eh, Rosilis es también, entre las numerosas actividades, presidente de TELUS Toronto Community Board y miembro del Consejo de Administración del Festival de Cine de Toronto. Eh, nos conocimos ayer, pero además de una educación exquisita y una extraordinaria generosidad y amabilidad, fue realmente un placer compartir la cena con él y también con su mujer. Eh, bueno, quiero simplemente agradecer la oportunidad que nos brinda eh, para que le podamos escuchar y para participar en este curso y, y espero que, que disfrute de la estancia en Donostia San Sebastián y bueno, le vamos a escuchar con muchísimo interés y disculpe de nuevo por el olvido. Thank you very much, Javier, and um, we uh, we did very much enjoy the uh, the meal last night. It was a fantastic opportunity to. Uh, to get to know uh, some of the organizers of the conference and to have a very um, robust and, uh, and uh, interesting discussion also to enjoy the cuisine and particularly the wine and that was in part why I was very glad not to be the first speaker uh, this morning. I was also a little intimidated when you introduced me as a professor um, earlier on. I hope that hasn't set expectations. I'm, I'm not a professor or a politician. I'm a business person and, uh, and a city builder in Toronto and, and here to talk about those things. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today in this beautiful Basque country and to talk to such a, an informed audience about such an interesting topic. Um, people in regions around the world are trying to wrestle with the same thing that you are, which is how do we, using uh, new structures and the existing structures we have, address the challenges that are, are facing us today? And, um, we're going to discuss a number of issues. I'm going to touch a bit on the situation in Toronto, um, in part because it's my hometown and I like to talk about it, but in part I think because there are parallels with what you are addressing uh, in this region and, and there are things that are different and it's important to understand those when you look at the example of civic action. Um, we certainly are, are dealing with many issues already discussed, like an aging population, access to opportunity for young people, affordable accommodation, uh, our environment, and particularly providing transportation for goods and services that are both environmentally and economically sustainable. Um, and in the same way that we share these challenges, I do commend the organizers of the event today for bringing us together to share ideas around the solutions. 
Um, solutions like a more collaborative approach to, uh, to providing or finding ownership for these problems. Um, you've heard today a few of the things that I do um, here in my volunteer role as the Chair of Civic Action, uh, which I'll talk about um, and has been recognized for its approach to collaborative governance. There are a couple of other roles that I think are, are relevant and hopefully interesting to you in terms of the perspective that at least I get to have. One is as the chairman of Post Media, which uh, as Javier mentioned is a large, we're the largest uh, operator of newspapers and digital media in Canada. We have about 181 publications. I heard Javier, you speak about the print and being in the newspapers. So if you come to Canada, I can take care of that. You can be in the newspapers all you like. Um, but, um, but I have to say that as someone who is, uh, is not necessarily in a good way, that's the problem. Is that, uh, but uh, but 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 the um, one of my one of my uh, mentors when I came into the role of chairman of that organization said to me, um, never take credit when someone is in the newspaper. And I said, but that must be the fun of it. People come up and say, I like my picture. And he said, no, no, never take credit because then you have to take the blame when the story isn't a good one. So I learned never to try to never to try to take the credit for anything that's in one of our papers. But but certainly the media uh, and the news media play a significant role, not always a constructive one, in terms of trying to find solutions. And um, I, I haven't asked Javier if we're on the record or off the record today. I'm going to assume we're on. But but I hope we can speak frankly about the role of media and the questions, perhaps, because I think it's an important one. I'm also an executive and owner of a global artificial intelligence company called Affinity, and that's interesting, I think, in this context, as we've talked about around technology. Uh, we operate in 20 countries, including this one, and what we see working with many of the largest companies in the world is the impact of technology, disruptive technologies, things like artificial intelligence and big data, on the ability of, uh, of communities and of those organizations to succeed and subsist. And, and so I think that that should be an interesting subtopic as well. But my hope is that, um, that this will be the beginning of a, a broader dialogue on this issue of collaboration and on the topic of untapped potential. I've already uh, learned a great deal listening to yourself and to Jim and to others about some of the different contexts for this. I think you will find this um, very applied in terms of a presentation. So Civic Action, um, our, uh, our, uh, our organization, um, the, the sort of logo or the words that we use when we're talking to people about our organization is we say, more, more action, less chit-chat. And I'm not sure how chit-chat translates, but, but, but one of the things that we find people are, are, uh, are anxious for is activity, is things that come out of a dialogue to mean something. And we think that we've found um, one way of doing that anyway that's worked well in Toronto. So, so to begin, I want to talk a little bit about the current landscape in, um, in Toronto and, and, and more broadly just to give you context for the successes we've had, the failures we've had at Civic Action, and uh, what we think we've learned. To start by talking about this urban reality that we face, I think there are some parallels um, between the region I come from, which is often referred to as the Greater Toronto Region, and, um, and the Basque Country, and, and Europe more broadly. And of course, there are some things that are different as well. Uh, like you, we're part of a larger country, um, and need to be part of a large country. We are part of Canada. But, but our life and much of the experience that determines what's important happens quite locally. My organization, Civic Action, was formed over a decade ago, largely in response to a number of, uh, of issues and crises that were happening. In particular, some of you will recall in 2003, there was a SARS epidemic that, uh, that uh, happened, uh, an uh, infectious disease, and in particular in Toronto, and the World Health Organization declared Toronto a no-fly city. So, uh, so people weren't supposed to go to our city for almost a month. And that obviously caused uh, a great... Uh, disruption in business and in, in people's lives, but also that along with some other issues. Uh, and we talked about this at dinner last night. It is often crises or issues that cause us to look for new and collaborative solutions. Um, so as I said, there are a number of parallels. Um, both the Greater Toronto Region and the Basque Country are, are very vigorous economies. We have robust private sectors, in both cases over 150,000 business owners, so critical uh, medium and small size business economies. Uh, we face significant issues, particularly around, among uh, employment for our young people and, and dealing with, with the silver tsunami, as they say, that aging workforce. As I understand it, in the Basque uh, country, the workforce projections say that 35% of the population are already 50 and older. And in Canada, that number is a little closer to 25, or sorry, to 20% or 55 and older. But we now, for the first time, have more workers over the age of 40 than under the age of 40. Uh, like our workforce, the infrastructure uh, that supports our economy is aging. I've read studies that talk about a $50 trillion global infrastructure deficit. Certainly, we're feeling that 
um, in the greater Toronto region um, in terms of the, uh, the transit infrastructure and the other physical infrastructure that supports economic growth. We also uh, have some unique challenges. Unlike the Basque country, which I understand has had a fairly stable population for some time, the greater Toronto region's population has grown to six million people with 150,000 new arrivals coming each year. A quarter of Canada's population is now located within 100 kilometers of the city of Toronto. And when you have that much growth that quickly, it's not surprising that you face some issues. Now, how are we thought of internationally? Um, Toronto is the most ethnically diverse large city in the world, 55% of our population. So over half of that population that I talked about are foreign born. So they, are, they were not, not born in Canada. So as a result of a very aggressive and we would say largely successful immigration policy, half of the people in by far the largest city in the country uh, weren't born in Canada. It's a significant North American financial hub, has world leading health and research facilities, also home to a vibrant cultural industry, our Toronto International Film Festival, uh, we'll be starting in just a few days. As you heard, I'm on the board of that. It's uh, sort of on parallel with your own San Sebastian Film Festival in terms of being one of the renowned film festivals in the world. So Tom Cruise will probably be flying from Toronto to San Sebastian or whoever is promoting their, their movie this year. Um, we also have a great benefit, which can't be overlooked when looking at us as a comparator. We are the largest city in a relatively safe and prosperous country, and we are next door to the world's, which is still the world's largest economy, the United States. So that, that brings uh, many challenges, uh, but it also brings many benefits in terms of the approach we can take both economically and culturally. Toronto is regularly rated as one of the five most livable cities in the world. Um, just last week, we were rated number four by The Economist. It's interesting that three of the other five cities were also Canadian cities, not to brag. Um, we also, of course, do love our ice hockey. Um, so, so I'm very proud of my hometown. I'm very proud of Toronto. But there are some things you might not know that are some challenges that I wanted to share. It's a very expensive place to own a home. And home ownership in the North American concept is a, is a very significant um, part of our culture. And on average, a uh, home in Toronto now costs over $1 million Canadian dollars. So uh, in the neighborhood of 800000 or 850000 euro. Um, it's increasingly crowded. 42% of Torontonians live in apartments, which is a big change for a country that has been blessed with available land and really a plethora of opportunities for people to have single-family dwellings. In fact, in 2015, Toronto had more high-rise buildings under construction than any other city in North America. Getting around their city is also a challenge. We have one of the worst commute times in North America. 82 minutes, on average, daily is the time it takes people in the greater Toronto area to commute from home to work. And that's, we're not proud of this, that's worse than Los Angeles, which most people think of uh, historically as, as a horrible place to get around. Well, we're, we're more horrible. Um, there's been a 20-year real in investment drought, and thanks in part to the, uh, the work of civic action, our transit infrastructure is now being built, but we have a great deal of ground to make up. I mentioned the diversity of our city, the fact that half of the people in Toronto weren't born in Canada, and it is strength, but consistently in integrating 150,000 immigrants year in and year out is not without its challenges. And like much of the developed world, we're simultaneously facing unsustainably high rates of youth unemployment and an aging population. So there are very big issues. And, um, and I think the, uh, the changes uh, that are coming um, are going to require players that have not been involved in, um, in some time. The, uh, the cavalry, as it were, uh, is coming in a number of forms uh, in terms of the people that are now supporting what we need to do in, in Toronto beyond the normal players. But in warm form, it's coming in the form of a thriving NGO, uh, non-governmental and not-for-profit sector. And also in a rapid evolution of corporate responsibility from it just being a nice-to-have to being a must-have in the private sector. To deal first with our NGO and not-for-profit sector, uh, Canada has the second largest such sector in the world. I think this comes in part from being a big, largely empty country that is very cold four to six months of the year. And so in a very cold place, um, you have an ingrained, perhaps uh, enlightened bit of self-interest about being nice to your neighbor and getting to know your neighbor. Because you never know whose help you might need to, uh, to shovel the snow or get you out of a snowdrift um, when, uh, when you're driving in the winter. Our NGO and not-for-profit sectors generate an average of 140 or 176 billion in income and account for just under 8% of the Canadian GDP. That's 20% more value add than the entire accommodation and food service industry. Uh, within the NGO and not-for-profit sector in the greater Toronto area, uh, we have found an able partner, uh, partners who have been quite um, willing to engage more broadly in, in addressing issues that traditionally were just the venue of government. 
As I heard last night, the Basque country has a long history of collective community engagement. And I think the potential of that, particularly as you focus that historic um, sense of community on current issues, is something that, uh, that will be very powerful and I look forward to learning more about. Now at the same time as we've seen the rise of the NGO and not-for-profit sector, uh, we've also seen a significant rise in corporate social responsibility. In Canada since the late 1990s, um, this has started to become quite institutionalized. It was motivated by a few external factors. First, there was a rapid increase of, in, in globalized industries and companies uh, started to become involved in a wide range of new issues, including labor standards and deforestation. In fact, Canada's position as a major global source of natural resources made it a natural hub for early environmental activism and that has itself evolved into a more active uh, sector. At the same time, uh, the uh, not-for-government uh, organizations and not-for-profit sectors challenged corporate organizations to be more accountable. Likewise, citizens started to challenge the business standards of corporations, and a link started to form before, between the reputation of our companies and their success as a business. I'm also pleased to hear that in the Basque Country, there's a strong tradition of public-private partnerships, especially to support the competitiveness of your manufacturing sector, and I think this will be very important to your future. Now, speaking of the future, I want to talk a bit about the next generation. Millennials make up 75% of the global workforce, or will by 2020, 2025. So uh, for those of us who are a bit older, they're certainly coming for us. Growing up digital and having access to people and information from every corner of the world, millennials have fewer boundaries and fewer connections to their traditional communities. And that's helped create not only a very well-informed, but globally very connected generation. Now, I often hear in conversations that we have about, about our city and about other cities about the lack of engagement um, or, in fact, apathy among younger people. And I have to tell you, I have a very different perspective and a very different experience. Um, I find a generation that's not apathetic, but that has a very healthy impatience for action. And what they might be apathetic about are some of the systems and structures uh, that, in their mind, have not... Um, delivered the results, or at least don't deliver the results in the time frame that one might expect for a, uh, a, digital, uh, a digital population. So, um, so we see that as something to harness, um, and we see it as a key point of leverage. The, um, the leadership shift that's, uh, that's happening now, in my opinion, and it's been written about quite broadly, um, really comes from, from these three factors. In the past, uh, and this I think leads to the discussion of the civic action model and, and this idea of collaborative governments and how it's worked for us. But in the past, when you ta read about leaders, when you hear about uh, the people who are, uh, who are traditionally in history, uh, the ones that we think of as, as the great leaders, the, the role models, that was someone who was at the head of the crowd. Qualities like vigor, self-confidence, and risk-taking were valued, and of course they still are today, but historically collaboration hasn't featured prominently in the leadership vocabulary. Um, I do believe, uh, and it's been written by many, that we are the early stage of a new era in leadership. Uh, the area in leadership where it's less about follow me and it's more about work with me. In that new era, collaboration is the new civic currency. There's some proof of this uh, happening in Canada right now on the political scene if you look at the recent elections for our national government, our provincial government in Ontario and in Toronto. Over the last two years, we've seen elections at each of these three orders of government where in each case the successful candidates were widely recognized and in fact had branded themselves as the most collaborative leaders on the ballot. But to have a collaborative mindset is only half the equation. You still need a neutral sandbox, a place where people can get together to talk about their ideas that's safe. In the case of Toronto Region, civic action is that neutral sandbox. It brings together unlikely players and gets people to leave their own sectoral interests and political obligations at the door. It's where the established leaders in our community collide with the new leaders in our community. It really is, from a civic action point of view, our, our secret sauce and the credibility we've developed in terms of being able to put people into rooms together that normally wouldn't be in those rooms is one of the key reasons behind our success. Now, one of the critical parts about this kind of table um, is that no one is sitting at the head of it. You need someone to convene it, uh, you need someone trusted to put it together, um, but there is no leader in the traditional sense. Uh, there's a collaboration, there's a conversation, and when it works, there's outcomes. And this is the role that civic action has come to play for, um, for, uh, for people in Toronto. 
Now, I'm not going to uh, profess to talk about, uh, about things that I only know as an observer, um, but clearly there are examples of what happens when, um, when we don't have collaboration. And, and this is a very, um, this issue uh, of what happens here, what happens in Spain, what happens in Europe, um, is not just an issue of importance to, uh, to, to Europeans. Um, it is very much an issue of importance, uh, importance globally. Uh, not to be dramatic, but as the first generation of my family in three who hasn't had to come to Europe to fight in a European war, um, the, the fact of how Europe evolves, the way it evolves, the way it works together, is an issue of the utmost importance uh, to people around the world. And so from an outside observer, it would appear that the, in some cases the inability to have those conversations, the inability to people to leave their agendas at the door, the inability of, uh, of the traditional institutions and leaders to, uh, to have the real conversations that are necessary is at the root of some of these issues. To take it back down uh, now to, uh, to the level of one city and one experience, um, in, uh, in the case of civic action, um, over 15 years ago a group of civic leaders came together and in the form of a summit, they came together to talk about what was a newly amalgamated city, the city of Toronto, and the actions that were needed to uh, deal with some obvious and outstanding issues. That event was so successful that in 2003, another summit was held, and that is where civic action and the model that I'm going to talk to you about was born. At the time, as you heard from Javier, I was the chief of staff to a recently re-elected mayor in the newly amalgamated city of Toronto. This was a a uh, city that had originally had seven different governments and was amalgamated into one, one government. The mayor at the time, a fellow named Mel Lassman, understood well that there was many issues that the city faced post-amalgamation. But his unique insight was that despite his uh, well-developed and understandable desire as a successful politician to get as much credit as possible, um, despite that well-developed uh, instinct, he recognized that a broader coalition of individuals was actually needed. And what Mel Lassman did was he uh, invigorated the beginning of civic action, but most importantly, he stepped out of the way to allow a broader group of people into the conversation that hadn't been involved before. Now, just a side note, uh, the current mayor of Toronto, a dear friend named John Tory, is in fact the immediate past chair of civic action, so our current mayor. And this is just a legacy of this partnership that is developed between the political class and the broader community in Toronto. So since that, uh, that coming together, Civic Action has provided a neutral platform for collaboration and for leadership focused on improving the region's social, economic, and environmental future. Since our inception, we've worked with over 7,000 businesses, with academics, with governments, with labor, and not-for-profit partners. So how does it work? Every four years, Civic Action hosts a summit that convenes over 1,000 city builders and leaders from across the region and all sectors to chart an action plan for our region. We start with research before the summit to identify emerging issues, but also to create a common and agreed to fact base. And when I come to the lessons that we've learned, this is one of the critical lessons that we've learned. We work very, very hard with from people from very, very different opinions to come to common understanding of the facts. And that allows the conversation to move beyond arguing about who's right on the facts and to, to action. So more action, less chit chat. We then use the summit and the work that follows to refine the issues further, and that's the space that civic action will then play in for the next four years. So another important feature of the model is that we don't presume to take over the role of anybody else in civil society. We presume only to galvanize broader support around a core group of issues for a time-limited period to affect some change, at the end of which either it will have been a good enough idea that others pick it up, or we'll stop doing it. So unlike many organizations that uh, seek to change our community, we have to change our agenda regularly, and we don't threaten the vested interests that often exist within the various silos of, um, of civil society. So for, an issue, for, for us to work on an issue, it has to have five characteristics. We have to consider it as uh, an intractable or emerging regional challenge, so we like tough things. It has to be suited to a multi-sectoral collaborative approach. It has to have strong potential for high impact. We would like to do things that make a difference. It also has to have no logical homes. We don't want to threaten the many great organizations, the boards of trade, the United Way, the various charitable organizations, so something that nobody is addressing. And finally, finally it requires a broad leadership and energy enthusiasm, um, solutions that can be implemented, but also, as I mentioned, from a time-limited point of view. 
Next, once the issues are identified, we've had the summit, we've done our homework, we've agreed on the facts. We bring together our multi-sectoral partners to determine what specific actions should be undertaken. That same group forms what we call a Champions Council, which then pulls together their own networks to take action over the, the following period. So that's the model, not terribly complex, but I'd like to talk to you now about three examples of specific activities that we have uh, undertaken since I've been involved. We have uh, mentioned from this podium, I think uh, everybody who's been up here has talked about the issue of youth unemployment. This is also very much an issue in, uh, in uh, Canada and in, uh, in, uh, in Toronto. Um, my understanding, and I'm just referencing this from the internet, so if it's wrong, blame the internet, but I've read that youth unemployment here can be as high as 30%, um, which, is, which is, sounds like a very high number, but, but in, in, in Toronto, it is similarly a very big issue. The greater Toronto region, we have 83,000 young people that uh, are not in education, employment, and training. And I don't have to tell the people in this room that that is not a sustainable situation. The inevitable outcome of that situation is, is a couple of things. Um, people leave. Young people leave. So we are a net beneficiary of the fact that in many other parts of the world, people don't have economic opportunity. That's why 150,000 people come to my city every year. Um, but where there is no opportunity, people will exit. And we worry about that with our young people. And there are also other broader social economic I impacts, including increased in the criminal justice uh, costs associated with, with managing uh, people who are not able to find work, um, and just underused capacity underused economic capacity. And of course, um, the, uh, the sadness of, of disappointed or unmet potential. So none of this is good and it's obviously an area where significant action is required. So um, we, under we identified that the private sector, which as I mentioned is a very robust partner in, in our economy but can do more, had a role to play here. We did new research involving partners, new partners, I'll talk a little bit about that, to identify the barriers to opportunity and engaged a multi-sectoral partnership who took quick action to form pilot projects. And two, year la two years later, we've seen some good results, and you see the, uh, the numbers up there. But over 300 young people and 170 mentors, one of the idea issues we, ide we identified, a core issue that really came from broader research, it wasn't that we had to reinvent the wheel on this, was the critical importance of mentors, uh, particularly in encouraging uh, young people from at-risk populations uh, to, to embrace opportunity and believe in their own uh, opportunity. Uh, we've mobilized nearly 500 youth workers uh, who reach about 6,000 young people and are now trained in 21st century job search skills. So we actually had quite a robust network of uh, people who work with young people, but they were still teaching them how to print a resume, how to create a, a, a piece of paper. So first of all, that seemed awfully irrelevant to the young people. But second, for those of you who are employers, it's not very much the way we... Um, we find, uh, we find employers anymore. And this leads me to a bit of the backstory that gives you a little sense of the, the neutral sandbox on this, on this particular example of Escalator. Um, Jeff Weiner is the uh, global CEO of LinkedIn. And LinkedIn has a presence in Toronto. It's, uh, we are their largest Canadian operation, but they are obviously a large a US based multinational corporation. And Jeff Weiner had been on a, a tour where he had gone to 20 other cities um, trying to find someone, a city, a community, that would embrace a vision he had around creating a real-time understanding of the labor market within a geography by understanding three things. Who was looking for work, who was trying to hire, and what the skills were to be able to actually get the jobs that were required. Essentially a triangle that would enable people to get skills to get the jobs available and for employers to have the employees that they wanted. Um, because of our approach at Civic Action, we had a very bright young person uh, who was part of our Emerging Leaders Network, something I'll talk about in a moment, um, who was in fact a, I'd call a upper mid-level executive. And he heard about the fact that Mr. Weiner had been to 20 places, all of them in the United States as it turned out, and found that none of them had actually embraced or been able to embrace sufficiently this project he wanted to undertake that, uh, that uh, LinkedIn wanted to underwrite. So we pulled together, uh, we got... Um, Mike, who's the, uh, the young person, uh, to go way above his pay grade and send an email to his boss, who then sent an email to Wiener, inviting him to come to, uh, to Toronto. And we put together for him half a dozen CEOs, uh, the head of our public service, so the most senior bureaucrat, uh, the most senior bureaucrat in our city, um, as well as some leading politicians, in a, in a room, in a private room, uh, to have a conversation about what it was he wanted to accomplish. 
And within six weeks of him leaving, um, we had our project up and running. We had that unique research project up and running because we were able to pull together that group of people and they were able to, with the resources they had to muster, grab that vision. We also had the leaders of the United Way, which is a major charitable organization, the leaders of the YMCA, to really mobilize and activate. Um, and that's in one reason why we were able to get the success we have. Um, we've also had over a thousand students graduate from targeted specific IT skills program. That was the, the outcome of much of the research was that the IT area was an area of high growth and an area where tangible skills could be provided in a relatively short time. Interestingly, feeding into Mr. Wiener's vision, which was that it takes a sufficient amount of time to get a job in a technology company just to go through the process that a candidate who knows the skills that are required can actually, if you have collaborative educational institutions, which now we do, get some of the unique specific skill training they need while they are going through that job search process. So they can actually be better qualified at the end of the process than they were at the beginning and more likely to be successful in terms of getting a job. So we are embarked on a second phase of this work that's now focusing very much on HR professionals in medium and larger sized organizations. Again, we targeted um, at-risk young people because of the 83,000 looking for work, they are largely from communities um, that are not as successful economically. Those are ethnic communities that are not as successful economically in our, in our city. And, um, and so looking at the systemic barriers that are built into their HR hiring practices that make it difficult in some cases for people to get that entry level work. So, one example, escalator. A second example, and I'm going to go through three here, is called the race to reduce. Uh, now you will no doubt know this, but office buildings everywhere consume a huge amount of energy. And one of the initiatives coming out of our summit was wanting to do some tangible things that were going to reduce the carbon footprint of our region, the costs of energy, um, and improve, um, improve the environment um, as well as the economy within, uh, within the greater Toronto area. Now both landlords and tenants have a role to play in, uh, in doing this. And it's a, it's a very interesting example here of, um, of why this idea of the neutral sandbox works well. So in this case, there were really three participants in our sandbox. Uh, one were tenants. Now you would think that tenants and landlords might actually get along and collaborate on things like, can't we all save money when it comes to energy costs? Um, but those of you who are a tenant will probably know that sometimes that isn't the easiest thing to do with a landlord. And those of you who are landlords will know that sometimes those tenants are just the annoying people who don't pay their bills um, on time. So in fact, what we had to do was take the major tenants, uh, which in, in the case of our region, there's a lot of big banks and a lot of big healthcare companies and you know, many, many uh, large and medium-sized companies, but take the representatives of those tenants and those tenants and put them in the room with the landlords, which ironically we found out were companies that were owned by many of the big banks and many of the big pension funds, in fact, many of them were living, working for themselves and staying in their own inside buildings that they owned uh, or owned by a pension fund, but they weren't even aware of that. The third party that was critical to this, however, um, was that, um, that there needed to be some external pressure. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, this fairly obvious opportunity had not been embraced, and so there were two levers in that regard. The first was government. So we had a provincial government at the time that was um, thinking high, hard about the environment, as all governments are, um, and frankly, we, we encouraged them um, at the level of the Minister of the Environment to speculate openly about whether regulation would be required to get the kind of cooperation needed to make sure that land, ten, ten, tenants and landlords got together and worked together. And lo and behold, um, once there was the risk of government regulation coming in, uh, suddenly there was a much more uh, open environment and interest from the ten tenants and the landlords in cooperating because nobody wants to be told what to do. We'd all rather choose to do it on our own. The second thing is a little bit more just about human nature uh, but, and, and speaks to the nature of the real estate business uh, in, uh, in Toronto. But most of the participants are men. In that industry, it is very heavily dominated by men. And men enjoy a good competition, it would seem. So do most of the women I know. But in this case, we were talking about an in industry dominated by men. And so we created this as a race, a competition. Who could do better? Who could win? Who could, who could reduce the greenhouse gases coming from their building? Who could work with initiatives to do simple things like turn off the lights and more complicated things like retrofit buildings with new heating and cooling? Um, and by making it a contest and making it a public contest and making sure that the winner was in the paper um, and that there was a big list of all the, of the, uh, of the people involved, uh, we were able to accomplish um, some, what in my mind are some pretty impressive, uh, pretty impressive things. At the end of the four-year program, 
42% uh, of the Toronto region's office space was participating, and there had been a collective energy use reduction of 12%. Um, and that's the same as taking thousands of cars off the road, and it put tens of millions of dollars uh, back in the pockets of tenants and landlords. So good for the economy and good for the environment. And it's also an interesting example because, as I mentioned to you, we do things on a time-limited basis. So at the end of the four years, or coming up on the end of the four years, which was just a short while ago, um, all the participants said, well, you guys are still going to run this. And we said, nope, you know, four, we, got, we got other things to do. We're moving on to the next set of issues. And they said, well, that's terrible because look at what we've accomplished. And we said, well, then if it's a good idea, um, you should find someone who wants to do it and you should fund it so that it gets done. And what happened was our local board of trade stepped up as well as LUMA, which is a, a building uh, association uh, co uh, committed to environmental standards, and they have taken over that program. So this is an example of our model. Uh, we are able to hand off a program that has worked and we hope will continue to be successful, but we're now allowed to deploy our resources elsewhere. My last example, and I think the one that I'm most passionate about, uh, has to do with, uh, with leadership and this issue of, of young, young people. Um, we are proud, and you would have heard that in my comments, about being the most diverse region in terms of a, of a city. Um, but unfortunately, we have work to do. Women account for 51% of the population, but only make up about 32% of the senior leaders, and, and even a smaller number at the very, very top of our organizations. Visible minorities account for 53.7% of the population, but hold less than 13% of senior leadership positions. So we think that there's really nothing more important that we can do. All of these initiatives, the two I talked about, and uh, the dozens of other ones we've done are all, in our mind, important and have changed Toronto for the better. But all of them are seeded by one thing, which is leaders. Active, energetic leaders who are willing to engage and make a difference. And we think there's nothing more important for the future of our city than preparing the people who will lead those cities. So going back a number of years ago, Civic Action decided that this was something we were going to focus on, generating a pipeline of civic leaders who got priority focus and in particular rep represented the diversity, I mean the ethnic diversity principally, but also the economic diversity of our, of our region. So one of the ways we do that is through our Civic Action Diversity Fellows Program. That was launched in 2008 and the program essentially has evolved to be one of our continent's leading urban fellows programs. And it really has changed the face of leadership in the Greater Toronto Area. We consider this sort of a civic MBA. So it harnesses the power of these future civic leaders and accelerates their learning and their exposure to each other. Um, we have them in the course of the program lead city building projects, explore leadership development, very personal leadership development that they wouldn't otherwise at the age they're at get access to. We match them with senior level mentors and we make sure that we expand their networks across the region. So since that started, we've graduated over 175 new leaders um, from the program. And of course now uh, what we see is those leaders taking leadership roles uh, at senior levels, not just within, within the GTA, but, but largely within our community. And we see the benefit of that, both in terms of creating a more diverse leadership set, but also creating leaders in our businesses, leaders in our government, leaders in our not-for-profit agencies who have that civic action gene integrated into them so that they take action um, and they think about their community. Another program is Civic Action's Emerging Leaders Network, which brings together energetic, motivated, and connected emerging leaders across the region. That's about 1,000 people today. Uh, they meet several times a month. Um, and this opens doors for various networking opportunities, uh, opens their mind to thought-provoking dialogue and different opportunities, um, and, and allows them to really embrace and understand the potential. For, uh, for, for them uh, to make a contribution, for them to be a, a region or a city builder. So I commented on this before, but when I do hear from people, and I still do um, often, and they're usually my age, so 50 or over, but when I hear them in Toronto talk about apathy among young people, um, I do one of two things. I either invite them to an emerging leaders network or I ask them to buy a coffee for one of our diversity fellows. Um, it's not that these people are not active and excited and engaged. Uh, they want to make a difference. What we need to do is through the traditional structures and through new structures, create venues for them to see that engagement mean something. In the case of the Emerging Leaders Network, they'll launch a dozen product projects themselves, um, all oriented towards, uh, you know, one of them uh, that was very successful in the last two years is something called Homecoming Toronto. 
And that came from a group of people in their 20s and early 30s who were sad because a lot of their friends had moved to the Silicon Valley. They, we have a fairly robust technology sector in Toronto, but not the same as the Silicon Valley, and they miss their friends. So what they do every year now is they host Homecoming Toronto, which is where they invite, and again, people pay their own way to come back, but they invite their friends who are now executives or technologists in these businesses to come back and we get the mayor there and we get a whole bunch of other uh, important civic types out to meet them. Um, but what we've seen uh, of the full group that comes, we're repatriating now 15 to 20 percent of those people every year. That's a great boon and that's something that uh, you know at Civic Action in the, in the area that I'm working at we didn't have anything to do with except that we empowered and motivated some of these people through our Emerging Leaders Network to take that project on. So it's a very exciting, um, the, the, le the leadership development programs I think are very exciting. Um, they build our human capital, create knowledge exchange between leaders, um, connect today's leaders uh, with uh, tomorrow's leaders. One of the things I've learned is that the existing leadership in our city, uh, they quite like meeting with these young up and coming leaders. I would have initially thought once upon a time that maybe they'd be too busy, but in fact, they find that quite invigorating and they, and they enjoy it. And in fact, many of the business people who are members of our organization use civic action to incubate their high potential leaders and use that as part of their, uh, their ongoing development. So a couple of, uh, a couple of lessons um, that, that we've taken away uh, as I conclude. Um, first, the best places to live and thrive have no sidelines. There's nobody standing at the side of the field, everybody's playing on the field. And everyone has to believe that they can be a city builder. And we have found a way to engage some people that weren't otherwise engaged through civic action. But this issue that has come up already about how do we find ways to get more people involved, I think is critical. Second, don't underestimate the impact of the neutral sandbox. People do need a place to come together. They need a place to have these conversations. They need it to be a safe place where they can know what they say in that conversation is something that, uh, that won't be shared um, or that will be shared constructively. Um, and they need to know that there are parties within the civic society who can um, play that role. And of course, we've seen that we don't, we don't have to invent new models. There's always in, in successful communities been those community leaders who had that ability to pull people together, to have those quiet and loud conversations, but often the quiet conversations are what lead to the loud and effective conversations. So don't underestimate the neutral sandbox. Third, you do have to change the process to alter the outcome. Um, I've talked about how we change the process in Toronto, that's just one model. But the traditional way of doing things will get you the traditional answers. And to the extent that you agree in your region, and from the comments I've heard, there seems to be general agreement that the traditional structures are not meeting the need, you need to find new and different processes, much like this uh, study that you're, you're doing um, in these two days. Fourth, common data helps massively with moving the conversation to action. If you aren't debating the facts, you can debate and talk about what's next. Trust me, for those of you who like a good debate, which I do, there's lots of good things to fight about, about what to do next. Uh, but if you can land on what the facts of the problem are, by and large, then the healthy debate is about how we solve things. Because I do find that once you have people focused on how to solve things, um, you're just very close, very close to getting to a solution. And finally, collective strength can lead to civic action. This idea of multi-sectoral collaboration, of bringing together groups that exist traditionally and typically in silos uh, into that neutral sandbox and then into the public arena to address uh, the broader issues is, um, is something that we have found very effective. So um, those are my comments. Um, I am very, very uh, honored to have had the chance to, uh, to join, join you and to be part of this conversation. And I, I absolutely look forward to the dialogue through the rest of the day, the dialogue we've already had, and the conversation uh, tomorrow. I think this, um, this creative thinking about these kinds of new models, uh, this, if you will, go back to this point about this new style of leadership where collaboration is a key attribute, is going to challenge all of us. Uh, we have to look at the way we've done things. We have to decide if we're happy with how the way we've done things are accomplishing what we need, and then we have to move to different models. And hopefully these examples uh, from Civic Action in Toronto will be helpful in your deliberations. Thank you very much.